Welcome to Public Forum, a community outreach program produced at North Idaho College on the shores of Lake Coeur d'Alene. Featuring guests from around the globe addressing a wide variety of subjects, Public Forum serves to educate and enlighten. Please join host and moderator, political scientist Tony Stewart, in welcoming today's guest. We're most pleased to welcome you to today's program. It's a very unique program, uh, issue that we have not dealt with before. Uh, it's about World War II, and one of the most unfortunate things uh, about um, segregation in our society was that in World War II, that our uh, Caucasian uh, troops and our African American troops were segregated, and it was through the great action of President Truman uh, after World War II that we integrated the military. But our guest is uh, someone who was in World War II, a very distinguished guest. Our guest is Paul uh, Recknetzer. He was a captain during World War II, and Later in the reserves, he was a uh, lieutenant colonel. Uh, what was unique about his role and what we're going to be talking about today is, as a Caucasian uh, gentleman, he did uh, have uh, charge of and was the officer of an all-African-American uh, unit. And uh, he now lives in Sandpoint, Idaho, and we're so pleased to invite him to our program. Thank you for being with us today. We look forward to the interview. Thank you. And as always, I'm happy to introduce our panelists. Uh, Janelle Burke, who is an attorney in the state of Idaho, and next to her is Erna Reinhart, who is director of public relations at North Idaho College, and Janelle Burke will commence today's questioning. Paul, welcome to our program. Thank you. You're a veteran of World War II. And all of us have a great deal of respect for those of you who are veterans. What, what years did you serve, and where did you serve uh, during the time that you were abroad? Uh, I was abroad from uh, Christmas 1943 to uh, April 1946. And, and where were you located? The initially, uh, we landed in uh, Liverpool, and we were stationed in what was called Area C, which is southwestern uh, England. Uh, you see the Dorset or Devon. I never have been able to figure out which county it was. And then we went over on the continent um, after D-Day to uh, support the Ninth Army during the Battle of the Bulge. And that would then, that put us into, uh, initially into uh, Holland, Belgium, and then we went on into Germany. Where, when the war ended, that's where we were, and uh, I went home from Mannheim. And so you were basically in the European theater. Yes. Thank you. Erna Reinhardt. Hi, Paul, and welcome to the show. Thank you. Um, Tell us about your early days in the Army, and did you train with the same unit that you traveled with, that you ended up going to England, or where did, where did you and your, your group meet up? Well, it's, it sounds a little strange, but it's a typical Army. Uh, no, you're, uh, when you enter the Army, you, everybody gets basic training. And I was, by virtue of the scores on my tests, I ended up in the Quartermaster Corps, and trained at what was then Fort Warren, Wyoming. And uh, at that point, I entered the Officer Candidate School and went back to Fort Lee, Virginia. After Fort Lee, after I graduated as second lieutenant, I went out to Fort Crook, Nebraska, to learn about how trucks and that sort of thing are supposed to operate. From there, it was just a random assignment. I still have the orders at home. Here's a list of all the officers graduating at Fort Crook, and there's three go here, three go there. No interviews, no nothing. And I entered. Uh, I was assigned to a, um, a 565th Quartermaster Battalion at um, Fort Gordon, Georgia, Cap Gordon, Georgia then, and uh, became a platoon leader. This was an all-black battalion with white officers uh, from company grade on up to the, there were no other, uh, there were no black officers. You refer to them as African Amer Americans, we, they were black or colored, that's the way w they were uh, described. And go ahead and continue, because I'm curious, then how did that experience, how was that experience there before you went overseas? Well, the, uh, the part I like to think about and like to, to tell, because it tells you a little bit about me and about how I felt about the assignment. Uh, I was a platoon leader in a D Company. So that was my first exposure 
to ever working with black, colored, or whatever, however you want to describe it. It had never happened in my schooling or anything else. And I really became attached to those guys. Uh, I don't know where they were from, but they must have been from the South because they were very friendly, happy guys to work with. Uh, and all of a sudden I was reassigned to another company. It's the only time in my life that I ever cried that mm. I can remember because I had become so attached to those, their boys to me. Well, they were all younger than I by a five to six years. And uh, so then in that, that new company, uh, I was a junior officer. Uh, and then we were shipped from Camp Gordon, Georgia to Miles Standish. And we went over to England on an unescorted uh, troop carrier, which was a converted uh, liner from the South African run called the Stirling Castle. Uh, we crossed in five days, which is kind of a remarkable thing. Unfortunately, the black troops were put in the A-hold, which if you know anything about a ship, that's as far down as you can get. But uh, it, was, uh, it wasn't all that bad. They, of course, that was the first time many of them had been on an ocean liner, and uh, that was a rugged experience for a lot of people. You know, they got sick and didn't smell too good and this, that, and the other. You know. But um, we, uh, we arrived in England in uh, relatively good shape. Uh, I like to tell the story that um, as, of course, we were the last ones off because we were coming up from the bottom, and I always spent, my, spent time with, with my boys because that's where the action is. And as I, we were going out through these various holes, I noticed a lot of rifles had been left behind by the other units on the ship. So I told my guys, pick up every loose rifle you find. So we came off the ship with some of them carrying a rifle on both shoulders, which came in pretty handy later on. I bet. <laughs> well, Thank you. Very interesting story. I would like to <clears throat> echo what Janelle Burke said, and you're uh, known as the greatest generation. We have great uh, debt to you because uh, the women and men of World War II saved uh, our democracy from uh, the atrocities of Adolf Hitler, the Nazis, and, and their allies. Um, and we really, really admire you. Uh, what I'd like to have you do now is you've brought uh, some photographs, three photographs, and they'll come up on the screen in a minute here, and you can see them. And if they'd bring up the first one now, then, uh, Paul, if you look at that, you can describe what that is. That's uh, on maneuvers in Tennessee. And those are lister bags, and that's where your drinking water was came from. I understand you, that you told me before the program that uh, the way those are made, and all the water didn't taste that good. No, it didn't. It tastes like burlap. <laughs> but when you're thirsty, you will yeah. drink it. Anything goes. You and, know. It, and certainly the humidity in the south, it gets very hot. And <laughs> that was one of the few sunny days. Most of the time it rained. I believe you said 29 out of 30 <laughs> days it rained there. I come it from that wet. part of the country, and it doesn't rain all the time. There are times when it's very dry, <laughs> but you were there when it was rainy. If we could have the second photograph, Paul will describe this one. These, this was a picture taken with, uh, with some of my non-coms, and I really don't recall whether that was the first platoon I was assigned to or the subsequent one, but uh, those were, were some of my boys. And uh, looking back, why... You know, I look pretty good. Uh, <laughs> and they all had their helmets on. I don't know why I didn't have mine on, but uh, helmet discipline is a very important part. And I cringe every time I see one of these shows and a guy's helmet strap is loose. Yeah. You didn't do that. You didn't do that. No, you didn't. And we have a third one here. That's the, that's the uh, cook, or the chief cook, uh, who's a sergeant, and that's the kitchen. And that's the same place in Tennessee. And it, but when you went overseas too, you had tents like that for the. No, well, I, not I, I, not well. You're, we did. You're moving we did. so fast. So, so how did you do your uh, in, cooking? In in England, we we had uh, a setup somewhat like that. Only we used hospital tents, okay. long tents, and we had them all arranged. We operated a, a depot distributing rations. So it's a. 
it was tenting um, mm -hmm. and, and cots and that kind of thing. On the continent, uh, it was everything imaginable because uh, you did the best you could. And uh, wherever we could requisition barracks, that's where we put everybody. But you certainly weren't, you were moving. And, we were right. in motion quite a bit of the time. One of the things that you were very nice to bring with you, uh, your uniform, um, this is the, I believe you call it the Eisenhower uh, style uniform. If our people will show that, you can describe it for us. If they can bring up the uniform, I believe well, they can. It, it, it's well, it's a jacket that ends at the waist which uh, permits you to carry a sidearm without the encumbrance of a, of a blouse, so to speak. And uh, uh, unfortunately, I could no longer fit the one I wore overseas. So in order to have something for our annual Fourth of July parade, I bought this from an army surplus place. Uh, of course, in the summertime, it's too hot to wear, but in Europe, that was the only uniform. And, and it's the authentic one, I mean, you just had That some, is, that's it. That's, that's exactly as it was. Yeah, those are the ribbons that I had when I came home in 1946. The patch on the left shoulder that you can see is the 7th Army, and the one on the right, which is the one that means most to me, is the 9th Army. The 9th Army was shortly, was disbanded as soon as the war was over, but the 7th Army is the one that General Patton was involved with. I have one other question, I'll go back to the panel. I'd introduced the program by indicating um, how unfortunate it was uh, that uh, we segregated our troops by race or color. Uh, they, all of you were there fighting for our freedom, and the good news is after the war, as I said, President Truman uh, did integrate the military. It was one of those great movements forward for us. Uh, in the units that you um, commanded, uh, did these issues ever arise? I, I was really impressed with the fact you talked about how much you really appreciated uh, those uh, troops that you commanded and uh, how did you deal with this? Uh, they came home and when they first got home, we, we, you know, places were still segregated in the South, but it was soon changed. But did this ever come up as an issue during the military uh, uh, operations? Not, not as such. I think the, uh, the, the most evident uh, difference in attitude depended on where the soldiers came from. Those that came from the South were very easy to get along with. They were happy and we really never had any problems. Those that came from the North that uh, were the beneficiaries of, shall we say, a little more education, uh, they caused a lot of problems. Uh, I got a lot of feedback from some, but for the most part, uh, the only reason I think I came out whole, so to speak, was because I really, I had no animosity toward anybody. Uh, this was my job. It was to get through the war with these people and to do the job that the Army wanted me to do, and that's it. And we really never had any, any problems uh, relative to that. No, no, no problem, I would say. Brave soldiers fighting, uh, and, and it was, of course, it was such an dangerous thing, war is always dangerous, but um, it was just a, a great victory to have the um, victory over the Nazis. Uh, with that, uh, Janelle Burke. You addressed in part the question that I want to ask you about, and that is the level of education that your troops had. W at that time, there was a thing called separate but equal education. And, of course, we all know what has happened historically since that time. But can you enlighten us as to what kinds of education your troops had? I would, I would, uh, you know, I never questioned it. Uh, but to go back a step, uh, when we went into basic training at Fort Warren, we had a group of white soldiers that came from a place called Sullivan's Hollow, Mississippi. They were illiterate. And uh, we had to read the manuals to them to train them. How, they, how that ever turned out, I have no idea because I left and went down a different path. I would say that uh, without having any specific knowledge that they all probably went through grade school. Uh, they all seemed to be able to write uh, and read because uh, it was our job to censor the mail so I know that they could write letters because I had to read them. Uh, 
but that was about it. And uh, I think that I think it's important to remember that uh, all the young soldiers, and it still applies today, are young men. Uh, and by that, their testosterone is levels are high. They're enthusiastic, and uh, they they can get into all kinds of mischief if they want to. But that's the way. That's what you get with 17, 18, 19 year old boys. Now, my second part of my question has to do with promotions. And in the military, of course, promotions are very important. What was the promotion avenue for the black soldiers in your unit? Well, the, uh, it depended uh, on, on their performance and uh, their attitude. I think the two uh, go together and it would be up to the company commander to uh, promote them. Now, uh, you can make a soldier a PFC, which is one Chevron. That's a company order, and that comes and goes. And when you see somebody with one stripe, it really doesn't mean anything particularly, except he's just a little bit better than the rest. The non-coms, the corporals, you're always looking for somebody. It, you, of course, you promote from within, and you're looking for somebody that evidences a little more leadership and then they become a corporal, and those out of the corporals come the sergeants and right on up the line. But they could not become officers at that point. Uh, I would, they were wouldn't limited. say they couldn't, but it wasn't an avenue that was readily evident. Now, for me to go into OCS as an example, I had to apply for it. Mm -hmm. And then I had to pass a board of review, and then they determined what, where you'd go and where you wouldn't go. And uh, so it was, the initial entrance examinations were all important in the military. That's how you first determined who was going to go where and what you had to work with. Erna Reinhardt. Before we get too far close to the end of the show, Paul, I want to invite you to share with us maybe what some of your special memories are from that time where you served between 42 and 46. And war is probably not <clears throat> a fun time, but I'm hoping that you'll have some well, special memories to share. I have one story that I, I like particularly, and that is we, uh, when we arrived in, on the continent, it was on Christmas Eve, and we'd been three weeks in a boxcar, and that gets a little old. And we we got settled, and the next thing we had to do on Christmas Day was was uh, guard uh, a million gallons of gasoline in five gallon cans and six hundred thousand rations, and they were stretched along a highway in Belgium outside a little town called Zeppelin. And uh, that lasted uh, thirty days, and it was just really really cold, and uh, it was a bitter experience. Uh, uh, one guard killed a white soldier, which was unfortunate, and we had a few other minor problems. But by and large, uh, within our own unit, uh, we did the job. The nice part was that uh, a few years ago, my oldest daughter was going traveling in uh, in Holland and went to Zeppelin, and uh, they she established a connection with them. And a couple of years later, on the cruise where I met Patty, they had arranged for a bus to leave the, the barge and go to Zeppelin. And we had a parade. And uh, I, it brings tears to my eyes because they had a little band there playing the Star Spangled Banner. Oh, yeah. And the people in Holland love Americans, and American soldiers particularly. And it was very touching to be referred to as a liberator, which I thought was a stretch. But uh, the crowning remark was, you're better disciplined than the Germans. And of course, <laughs> the Germans had been there ahead of us. But uh, Zeppelin was a, a high point in my experience over there. Great. In recent months, we've seen some national television programs in which uh, numbers of into uh, troops from World War II have gone back to Europe and gone to some of the towns and as you experienced, they uh, 
have open arms and embrace them and have uh, bands playing, uh, I think that you do deserve the credit because you did liberate uh, Europe from, and the world actually, from this uh, terrible threat. When you went into Germany, um, did you have some of the experiences that the war was ending as you went into Germany, but were you, did you visit any of the um, concentration camps? I did. I, uh, over uh, New Year's, uh, I had a staff car and I drove down to Dachau. And of course it had only been liberated about six months at that point and uh, I took photographs and uh, the boys in my outfit then, which was the uh, quartermaster group, they put an album together for me, which I still have. And I mentioned that to you over the phone. Right. If you ever like to see it, I'd be happy to show. There are no pictures that are unusual uh, that haven't been done by others, uh, except there was a barrel of bones. And I recall reaching into the barrel, and I picked up this bone, and I thought, what on earth are you doing? And I put it back, you know, it was, uh, but it's a very touching scene. And there were some of the camp survivors there that we talked to. And uh, the hard, the, the thing that's difficult for me to, to understand is how the, the Germans living in the neighborhood could say it didn't exist. I mean, it's impossible. The evidence is just overwhelming. Uh, a few years ago here, we had something called Beyond Darkness, a, a symposium. And a young man came to me, I'll never forget this, this was back in the 80s, 1980s, and his grandfather had been in World War II and had a camera and took some photographs at the, one of the concentration camps. And he, you know, in those older days, they were in little cans. He brought them home and put them on the shelf and refused to ever develop them. A really emotional time for me is that this grandson brought them to me in this little can and I took them, were able to develop six of those. It was the, you know, they were very frail at that point, or, or um, it was hard to develop them, and we made that one of our exhibits, which now is in the library. So, like you're saying, they're all, all over this country, in other countries, we have all kind of evidence of what happened. Um, was at, and our former mayor of this city had, had helped liberate one of the camps. With that, Janelle Burke. The life that you lived while you were a soldier, um, was pro it was different than anything, of course, you've experienced before or since. Um, what was life like for the men in your unit? Um, were the, most of them single? Did they have girlfriends? Uh, what did they like to do? Did they like for for recreation as much as there could be? Did they sing? Did they uh, draw? What kinds of things happened? Well, they really preferred to get off the base. Uh, I think the most telling thing is that uh, you got these soldiers that came from a segregated society and we land in England where it's not a segregated society. And when they, they get a pass to go to town, they're free as a bird compared to what they had experienced over here. Plus, uh, their exposure to white women was uh, different, shall we say the least. And uh, the only way I could go along with that really to help keep everybody ha reasonably happy was we used to have a dance every other Saturday night and I'd send two trucks into town and they'd bring the dance partners out to the base and uh, we'd, they'd dance and then we'd take them back and of course the ladies like to go there because uh, I can remember seeing one with a sandwich in each hand. They're hungry. In England, that wasn't too bad, uh, but in on the continent, it got really very bad, uh, particularly in Germany, because the women were very hungry, and uh, mixing with the white women, I would have to say, was a, a big attraction. That was. The number, the number one thing. Share with us, Paul, some of your feelings about what it was like to come home after being over there. Well, you can't wait to get home. Uh, um, no matter what they told you you had to do to get home, you <laughs> did. <laughs> and uh, officers had to have 72 points to get home. And uh, I had 
67, and I figured out a way to get five more. Which <laughs> <laughs> you may or may not want to discuss. No, 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 it was perfectly legitimate. Uh, we had gone through a combat zone, I hadn't gotten credit for it. Oh, okay. And uh, so I'm the only one in the company that has five more points than all the rest, but, but nevertheless, it was perfectly legitimate, and the minute I got it, then I ended up taking home a sister unit of the original battalion, and uh, it had a whole bunch that had been court-martialed because as soon as the war was over, the discipline really got to be tough because they, they wanted to take off. And they, you know, the war is over. So, so they left the base wherever we were, and then as soon as they got back, they got court-martialed. And that was a six-month sentence. And darn if I didn't end up bringing home all those that I had court-martialed. But they were doing they didn't care. I mean, we got on a ship, which was a Liberty ship. It took two weeks to get home, which was terrible, but they were so glad to get home uh, that, and they gambled all the way and drank and so on. <laughs> all you want to do is get home <clears throat> and uh, go back to, and I went back to my job with Phillips Petroleum that I'd left and uh, I can remember I went down to the office in my civilian clothes and the girl said, come back tomorrow with your uniform. <laughs> Right. That was it. Certainly, when all of you came home, you came home to great celebration, and the Americans, as they should, they embraced you. And I don't uh, recall any embraces. <laughs> <laughs> well, certainly, many did that came home. There were great parades and yeah. and celebrations. I'm sorry you missed that. I am too. <laughs> yes, ladies and gentlemen, our guest today has been um, a captain and later a lieutenant colonel. Uh, is in World War II. Paul uh, Recknister, and uh, he now lives in Idaho. He lives in Sandpoint, and he was gracious to come down with his spouse today to do this interview. And uh, Paul, we thank you so much for doing that, and we wish you good luck. And thank you. And um, hope you'll come back and see us again sometime. Anytime. It was a great, great time in my life, and I survived. <laughs> yes, you certainly did, and uh, and we hope that you continue to have a, a good life, and will continue thank to you. do so in the future. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you'll join us again next week when we will move to yet another issue uh, at that time. And until then, please have a good week. I am Tony Stewart. Recorded on the campus of North Idaho College, Public Forum is the longest running in-house college production on PBS. Each episode is pre-recorded live and is an educational outreach from North Idaho College. Please join us at this same time next week for another edition of Public Forum on this public television station. Music